Hello there. How are you doing? He's back. Hello. So you must be Terry. I am. Yes, Hello. I recognize you. I, I recognize you from your picture. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> How are you doing? Testing audio. I'm doing good. Good. Glad to hear it. Okay, I can hear you now. All right, great. So are we we kind of waiting for others to show up here the first yes, minute or I'm, so? I'm guessing Marco should be along any any moment now. John Davis said that he was coming. Okay. So, punctuality isn't uh, I'm not complaining, but it's 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 not written with a capital P around. <laughs> Got it. Well, I figured I better not be too late for oh, well. a discussion of my book. <laughs> one, one can always be fashionably late, especially <laughs> if we're discussing your book. <laughs> Say, there's Marco. Yeah, well, I was actually hoping you would be uh, late, Terry, so we could say um, patent pending. But <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that joke before. I'm sure you have. <laughs> <I'm> sure. <laughs> and it won't stop us from telling it. <laughs> patent that connects. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hi, Terry. Hi, Marco. Good to see you. You too. So I take it you've met Ed and Doug? Actually, they didn't tell me their names yet. No, and, and it's not always showing up. I'm Ed, um, just in case you're wondering. Uh, the other. Nice to meet you, Ed. Yes. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm located in uh, Germany these days. So okay. that's one of the reasons the thing, these things take place so early for Marco, so that I can get here. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's the later part of the evening for you. Yes, it's 9 o'clock. You know, it's still kind of light out. You know, which is, we're getting to that time of year where we have lots of light. So, Hello, John. Okay. Yeah, so where in Germany are you? Um, right, almost uh, at the geographical center of Germany. Uh, it's a little town or a little city called Bad Hersfeld. Uh, it's not too far from the Wartburg where Luther translated the Bible. It's about an hour north of Frankfurt. Okay. I was going to guess Heid Heidelberg, and you said geographical center. But I guess yeah, that and geographical center is a little bit uh, further north than Heidelberg. Heidelberg is about two yeah. hours from so. Okay. Go ahead. Mm. And Doug, you're in Kentucky? Yes, the, the other Frankfurt. Um, the other Frankfurt. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to well, say hello and uh, also note that I'm having technical issues, so I'm probably the one with a strange sound in the background that's my computer fan running. It's the only connection I have right now. But uh, yeah. Did get a chance okay. to um, read and or purchase and read the book, Terry. So uh, I really enjoyed the the final, the second half of the the book. It's very, oh, good! Very fitting to my location here in Frankfurt and the. I, I've mentioned the the bubble that I'm in myself. Um, it's it's not the most becoming location with uh, conservative values, but I, I've learned to come to terms with it. So. Cool. Maybe I'll learn something from you about that. That's a very challenging. You have to be very, very highly evolved to communicate with people whose frames of meanings are categorized as not being quite so highly evolved. That or uh, silent <laughs> or withholding your speech at certain times. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Doug is extraordinarily evolved. I can attest to that. And John, I don't know. What, what, what would you say? I gave up on that a long time ago. <laughs> I'm just a 
poor, poor kid from the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, the best he can in the big city. It's getting bigger and bigger every day. Whoops. Yeah. Concretely, that would be New York. Uh, John is in New York City. Okay. And Terry, you're uh, up in Marin? Yep. Okay. So now we're physically located on the globe. Okay. And I don't. I think this will be our, our crew for today. And since we're already started, as, as far as recording, I, I, I would like to propose that we just go into this conversation. And I would like to begin with a, um, an exercise in genealogy. I, I'd like to trace the genealogy of this occasion, of this conversation, back to, uh, you know, through the phases of our relationship, Terry, because okay. really coming out of um, our meeting each other and interacting over the years and developing a working relationship, a friendship, uh, various levels of, of relationship, which have um, unfolded, diverged, converged in, in various ways uh, over the years. And I, I think that <clears throat> the meaning of this conversation and its radical uh, potentialities, if, if such exist, uh, are really coming out of that particular relationship. And then how the other context and the other lines of, of um, being kind of merge into this, John's particular experience, Doug's particular experience, Ed's particular experience, and maybe beyond those, or certainly beyond those, the, the other, you know, the webs of relationships that we all share um, or don't share uh, in the wider social space. Uh, we've talked a little bit about integral, the integral movement, integral community. Um, there's one particular interpretation of that, which is associated with uh, Ken Wilber's uh, integral philosophy. There are other streams of integral thinking that uh, are associated with other thinkers. And there's also just the general idea of integralness or even wholeness, which you write about, uh, that... Um, also inform, I think, the context for this conversation, and which if, I think if, we're, if we could retrace some of those steps or some of those interconnections uh, will lead to perhaps a more fruitful outcome. That, that would be my hope. Okay. And then, um, so after my, I'd like to offer a genealogy from my perspective and then invite you, Terry, to... Uh, offer your own version of that or fill in the gaps or uh, in any way that, you know, occurs to you, yeah. um, respond to that. And then I want to ask you to um, address the question of what would make this conversation, this occasion here with all of us into a radical or a meaningful or um, a significant uh, event. Uh, and, and then from there, I'd like to open it up and allow John and Ed and Doug to um, reflect, share, basically just let the conversation unfold as it will. And um, we typically go for a, up to a couple of hours. Uh, so we could see wh wherever the natural kind of closing point is. And, um, and, and we'll see what happens. Uh, something usually happens uh, when, when we bring our minds together like this. And uh, it's, it's a uh, honor and a uh, pleasure uh, to welcome you, uh, Terry, and um, to congratulate you for completing your book. Uh, I was privy to some of the process and some of the sausage making uh, behind, behind the, the scene, fine sausage, uh, of course, in the end. Uh, but uh, I know how much, how, what a struggle it was for you uh, to, to bring all this material together because it, it truly is um, vast and difficult and challenging. And um, I know that you brought a lot of sincerity and um, a lot of determination uh, toward bringing it into some kind of resolution that would be useful uh, for people. And, and I know that that comes out of this, out of a whole lifetime of your own process in doing this and your own 
education in the school of life and in your practice as a spiritual practitioner and various other roles that, that you've played. And our paths in these lifetimes cross in Boulder, Colorado, in around 2003, 2004, uh, at um, I think I believe it was in Ken Wilber's loft. In, so that would have been Denver, actually. Uh, but Boulder, Denver was uh, being conceived at that time as a kind of epicenter, I'm putting all these in quotation marks, an epicenter for um, this integral renaissance or this integral movement or this integral awakening that was happening around, around Ken Wil Wilber's work. And I'd become infatuated with his work when I was living in New York, um, moved to Colorado in 2003 to get involved in some way. I didn't have a, a great I plan, exactly. I was just called to. Uh, and Wilbur at the time was uh, starting an organization called Integral Institute, II. And um, a lot of people around the world were becoming attracted to it, interested in it. And you were among them. Um, and there's a, a whole history behind that for you, which I'll let you address if you want to. But you had a book that you were working on at that time, a manuscript, which was called The Terrible Truth and the Wonderful Street Secret. Uh, I think it was encountering or responding to our, ev our evolutionary emergency. Answering the call of our evolutionary there. emergency. And you sent that manuscript to Ken to have a look at. I handed it to him, yeah. In his loft. Uh, and that, be, that initiated um, a se series of events that um, included you becoming an integral teacher, an integral coach, an integral author. Um, around 2006, 2007, we became co-authors, you and I, with Adam Leonard and Wilbur of the book Integral Life Practice, uh, which um, is a kind of manual for body, mind, spirit, shadow, relational um, practices of, of cultivation, of, 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 of awakening or of consciousness, etc. Et, et and, and around that time, I was becoming disillusioned with the Integral Project and with my experiences at Integral Institute, which as exhilarating and catalytic and creative and inspiring as they were, also had a shadow side, uh, which became more and more consequential and which caused me to withdraw from that milieu. Um, however, we continued our relationship, and I began working with and for you uh, in the capacity of uh, as a web developer, web designer with my wife, Kayla. We designed, I think, your first website and your subsequent websites, even your, your newest website. Uh, and uh, and I, so and at another level, we continued a kind of thinking relationship where the ideas that were coming out of this integral kind of convergence um, and the not, you know, not just the, the unity oriented and the happy ideas, but also the friction and the, the conflict that came out of that became a theme of our conversations. And some of those led into the book. And then the book also includes many other streams uh, that, you know, that are based on your, your particular experience. But one of the turning points in, in our relationship was around in around 2011-12, when the Occupy movement uh, was um, uh, kind of exploding, uh, you know, onto the onto the world stage, and you had wanted to come back to to your manuscript, Terrible Truth and Wonderful Secret, and to revise it, to finish it. It had not been completed, um, and to really bring it forth into the world, particularly at this time of, of crisis. And this is before Trump. This is, you know, we couldn't even imagine the crisis that we're in now then. Uh, but we sensed an opening, a moment. Yeah. And uh, we began working together on that. And we're going to be co-authors of a book, which through the process of conversation and editing and, and brainstorming and thinking, changed title to The Integral Revolution. And uh, we, you know, we worked on that for a couple of years. Uh, I put my mind to it, and you, in effect, were a kind of patron uh, to me in, in working on that. And that brought us to around the end of 2012, where 
the kind of internal contradictions that I still felt <clears throat> around the integral movement, the integral project as such, combined with a resurgent desire on my own coming through me to do something different, to do something radically outside of that particular context, I think caused a, a divergence. And uh, after... Well, it was also, there were, we had somewhat different ver visions for the book itself. And um, I, I think you were more of a radical artist and I wanted that radical creativity to shoulder its responsibility for societal change. I was more politically focused and there was a particular moment when you did a, a thorough and very elegantly written uh, revision of uh, the chapter one that uh, was at the core of the book and it didn't speak for me. And when we realized that we didn't, we couldn't really speak with one voice. That was when I realized we weren't going to co-author that book. Right. And, and for me, it was a kind of crisis of identity, a crisis of meaning. I didn't know what to do exactly. Um, and that set me on the path that has led me to where we are, where I am now, where we are now. Uh, in my case, it involved initiating some, a series of social cultural experiments, beginning with this summer reading of uh, a big novel by David Foster Wallace, Infinite Jest, that led to infinite conversations and the theory of everybody and metapsychosis. They're all kind of coming out of that that time. And now uh, in the context of creating a, uh, a cooperative community that in a lot of ways I think is want, wanting to embody the values that you write about and that you've articulated in your book, your new book, A New Republic of the Heart, um, it kind of comes back around uh, to this, meta this space where we are, um, I think, practicing a kind of opening to the future, what wants to emerge, what kind of wholeness or what kind of response wants to occur in this context that we're in uh, of what you write about as a, a global crisis, some call a meta crisis, a mega crisis, this planetary, ecological, social, cultural, spiritual like, catastrophe uh, of this moment. That's, that's one narrative. So, um, over the course of the last couple of years, you, you know, brought that book to completion. Uh, and um, as I've been reading it, I'm seeing that it's really become something it's of its own. It's become something um, whole. And so I want to invite you to bring that wholeness forth and, and um, to share it with us so that we could uh, examine it, play with it, uh, more than that, I mean, really take it seriously because you have come to this through a serious process and, um, and learn from it. Um, what can we learn uh, from this exchange, from this um, intellectual and cultural communion? I think that's all I have to say as far as as far as the genealogy i feel like i probably missed a lot of things that are important uh, but i trust they'll come through well i'm not sure that we need to do an impeccable job of our relationship genealogy i mean i could say to you guys that uh, you you've met marco and you can see what a he's a brilliant guy and and very sincere there's a purity and a brilliance and a creativity and capacity that are uh, extraordinary so in many ways i kind of chose him as my you know, younger collaborator. He was he was the young person I wanted to combine with creatively, and that's why I've been a, uh, you know, on whatever terms were working. You know, we were we were both unpaid collaborators of Ken Wilber on the Integral Life Practice book. We, I've paid him for certain things. Here I am now, uh, in the context of Cosmos Co-op, but he's just somebody I've I've felt. Uh, it's hard to find worthy uh, 
collaborators and I've valued you, Marco, in a whole variety of ways. So that's uh, really what's at the essence of it for me. It's also true that you, you carried in the integral community, there were an awful lot of people that we might describe as ivory tower intellectuals or spiritual inward, uh, you know, focused uh, folks or who were dilettantes in one way or another. And you carried a certain uh, recognition that, like, for instance, you were very deeply involved in the Obama campaign. And I was also, I also did, did things. And so we, we, we noticed that we had some very, there were, there were many ways our sensibilities resonated. And uh, so that, that, that kind of has something to do with our history. Um, and, you know, it remains ongoing. But when I, when I think about who, uh, uh, who I can uh, uh, share the creative opportunity and responsibility of uh, furthering this work, you know, no, nobody's exactly the same as, as, as me, but you're, you're, you're someone who's, uh, it, it, it takes a lot for you to make a commitment to something, but when you're committed to it you, and you bring your full self into it, uh, remarkable things take place. So uh, I, I hope to capture your imagination more and more with the essential truths that I think I've synthesized. And then, you know, I can make a claim for the book. I really do. My attempt in this book has been, you know, what, one of the things that I've seen is that in our world right now, people, you know, everybody's become an entrepreneur, had to become an entrepreneur because of the nature of the way the marketplace for attention and ideas has evolved. Um, and because of that, uh, there's a... Um, It, there are everybody then ends up competing with one another and even when we confront challenges that we can actually only solve together finding ways to effectively become collaborators and genuinely support each other is, is tricky so in uh in trying to penetrate the, the stuckness of our cultural conversations, I, I saw that there would have to be more and more people who would recognize that the uh, um, Hi, Lisa, I'm in the middle of uh, kind of saying something about what my book is. Uh, when I recognize the survival challenges of, of this moment in time culturally represented something noetically. It's, it's a little like in Robert's Rules of Order, there's a thing that people can do. The, I call the question. And when somebody who has the authority to call the question, the person chairing the meeting has to allow a vote. And in some sense, our circumstances are calling the question and we're all going to have to vote. Uh, the, the, the endless uh, complexification and, and the uh, balkanization of discourse in mind into thousands of little conversations and nobody can seem to comprehend the totality of it. And meanwhile, we're all together on the Titanic sailing into uh, profound dislocations. Uh, uh, it, 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 we're at a tipping point and that tipping point changes something. It makes it possible for us to recognize that in a sense, I'm being faced with questions that I can't answer alone, that I can only answer with others. And yet we're in a inherently competitive uh, economy. And it's even now an economy of ideas and attention that tends to divide us. And what 
is most precious to me as the ways that I have a unique insight and I have a unique point of view. And so coming together is sort of undermined. So a different kind of discourse becomes necessary, a kind of shared inquiry. And I've tried to create a, a grand synthesis because I am a lifelong student of, of the real matter of the inner work. And I, I think that this synthesis, it's not the only synthesis or a perfect synthesis, but it, I think it's the first synthesis that is adequate to certain challenges. And I hope that it will catalyze, you know, my, my role model, my, you know, my ideal, my, my highest aspiration was for the synthesis to function a little like the dialectical materialism of, of Karl Marx, you know, which people saw the sense of it in many, many places. And it catalyzed action that made real difference. And that hope that uh, a synthesis could be adequate to address so many things that we're all talking around, you know, we're in a culture that's so in such a deep denial that, that maybe we could come together in a different way. And these revolutionary, revolutionary wholeness, revolutionary love could actually be activated. So that is what the, the book is about. And, and it's interesting that just a day or two ago, uh, one of the integral bloggers looked back at an essay that Marco and I co-authored called Occupy Integral that was published in 2012. And uh, in some sense, uh, it, it, it expressed very well many of the sentiment, sentiments that we share and that express themselves in different ways in Cosmos and in A New Republic of the Heart. Um, but in, uh, in, in this moment, what I would hope is that we can be profoundly vulnerable and not treat this as if it's merely an intellectual discussion, but a meeting in being between people who love and care and who are related to a future that's dependent upon the behavior of human beings in our lifetimes and who face a kind of moral responsibility and yet who don't know how to acquit it and who are asking impossible questions together and who hope to find our way into, uh, into a way of being more true and to be a, a yes for, the, for life in this moment and, and in the future. So... I think that's enough of me. Hope that helps. Well, I'll just note that we had, uh, although we want to go beyond just an intellectual discussion, we did have some reading uh, for this uh, session. And for the sake of anybody watching this, um, specifically that those were uh, the introduction in chapter one of your book, optionally uh, chapters two and three. There's a PDF of the of that material on the website infiniteconversations.com and the topic for this particular cafe. So that gives us a common context and common language. Um, everyone here is already conversant to some degree or another with integral thinking theory, but that doesn't have to be the focus, um, right? <laughs> um, I, I, I would like us to focus on your book and what you have to say and what you're saying and, um, and for that to connect in some way with what we've already been talking about and thinking about and reading. Uh, this is the 21st or 22nd, I believe, uh, Cosmos Cafe session. And it's really interesting because it's developed a kind of life of its own. It has its own field, uh, its own um, shape. Uh, and uh, so I almost don't feel like myself exactly, or like a sep like my uh, when I'm in these conversations or even just preparing for them, it's like a meta mind is is emerging. But I'm still very singular. I'm still very myself, very much myself. So it's that pr um, aspect of conversation uh, is it's central to your book, and I'd like to think we're enacting something like it here and that we could learn uh from the dialogue with with you know all that you bring to the to the table so with that i'll open it up and um
invite anyone else, John, uh, Ed, Doug, Lisa, uh, to, um, uh, to speak. Although we should maybe uh, introduce Lisa. Lisa, Terry, um, have, have you met before? No, I don't think so. I don't think Hi, we Lisa. Hi. Um, sorry I'm late. Uh, the, you know, it's been one of those weeks, um, and I might need to leave early, but the topic just grabbed me. So uh, in the midst of the busyness, I felt I had to be here. <laughs> Great. May I make a comment, or does someone else have a burning desire to do so? Okay. okay. Um, good to see you, Terry. I, I read your. Um, can I quote you? I hope you don't mind. Sure. <laughs> um, this is a paragraph I really liked. Although I was, you were talking about a shared intersubjective field. Uh, Although I was not a performer in a play, the effect was like that of breaking the fourth wall and exposing to each other in the room, each of us nakedly in my own version of existential confrontation, I was revealing and dramatizing. This simple shift broke through a certain detachment and immunity that had previously prevented the discourse from implicating us and catalyzing a living transformational confrontation. No amount of third-person discourse could have accomplished this breakthrough. Um, so, and you also mentioned participants in this kind of intersubjective field must be adequate in their development for any praxis to be possible. So I think that's a great uh, description of this uh, speaking from first person in a group. Uh, that is often, most of us, I think, have been trained in um, third person descriptions. And that's a comfort zone many of us have. So um, I, I witnessed you in action in New York. Um, I came to some of your talks. I think it, it, your partner was Deborah, Deborah Boyer? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I got some um, great insight from both of you. Um, just a little bit about my genealogy. <laughs> is the um i was i've been reading ken wilbur i guess for 30 30 years and um what i enjoyed when um i i got involved in the integral groups here in new york was uh you know a very feisty uh new york kind of energy and um what i i found that uh there was a kind of dominance though of a very what I would call like upper west side middle class professional type and with a lot of therapy and very well educated um, there weren't too many ivory tower intellectuals but I think there was a great uh, appreciation for ivory tower intellectuals and certainly Ken Wilbur if not an ivory tower he was definitely a, a powerful intellectual that many people like myself were attracted to but I also was aware that I come from a very working class, underclass, uh, downtown, bohemian, um, a gay activist. I was working in, in many AIDS organizations for many years. Um, I was working in very volatile environments where uh, I was advocating on the behalf of people who were a persecuted minority in more ways than one. And... Um, there, there was a lot of different ethnicities mm -hmm. that I was dealing with. And, 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 and this, uh, in that world, no one knew or cared anything about Ken Wilber or integral theory. Um, so I was sort of this guy in between uh, these kinds of um, different worlds. And so when I would go into those integral forums, coming from... Um, the kind of spaces that I was trying to make sense of using integral theory. It was very challenging because I was very used to a robust activist, first person. This is my reality. <laughs> you know? And if I don't, if I don't uh, direct attention to this, no one else will because we were very up against it. And so, but I, I noticed that a lot of people 
uh, that ruffled their feathers. You know, it sort of was a different style. And I found people going back into spiral dynamics, um, going into the quadrants, um, sort of entering into what I thought was a articulate, but very third person um, set of descriptions, mm -hmm. which uh, had extremely limited value for the kinds of issues that I was dealing with. Right. Um, at the same time, lovely people who gave, who were very, uh, gave me their attention. And that was of great use to me because that helped me stabilize a lot of the instability that I found in, in the, the situations that I was in. So that just gives you some of my genealogy. And this was, I think, right before uh, Occupy and right before the economic downturn, which hit a lot of people. And a lot of people who are middle class were not so middle class anymore after that downturn. So I think that uh, uh, everyone sort of shifted from a sort of, there was a kind of complacency, some anxiety to a lot of, uh, well, what went wrong here? Because someone wasn't paying attention. And I think that uh, that's now when I look back on that, I, I start to appreciate that that question about competence that you opened up, uh, because I had a very perplexing issue that I shared with the group, very a first person, very vulnerable, very um, un unstable kind of a description I was trying to, to bring into a group dynamic. And I felt, I felt you were great because you received it. You registered the affective tone and which many people had not been able to do. And I think you, um, you and Deborah did not try to fix anything, but you just were very attentive. So I felt that you were practicing that, letting that fourth wall come down and letting the aesthetics of the relationship be primary rather than any theory about anything at all. So I think that's um, something that I want to, uh, appreciate once again and how useful that was for me and how you you mentioned how important it is to express the kinds of things i was expressing with those who within a community of competence that not everybody was competent enough to handle that kind of uh instability but Emotion, then, you mean emotionally integrated receptive compassionate Yes. That sort of stuff. Yes, and yeah. not everybody, not everybody, not everyone's first person is, I think, mm -hmm. some people who are grappling with very messy stuff that they don't have a map for. They may, they're not borderline personalities. It's the difference between a, a, someone who's a borderlander and a, um, you know, a, someone who's, a, you know, tanking. So I think it's a different kind of thing. And so I, I just share that with you because uh, what I love about this group uh, that, uh, that Marco has uh, sponsored each of us, I believe in uh, allowing the uncanny or the idiosyncratic or the odd to come forward in a, in a, in, in a first person that's kind of emerging um, along with all of the other things that are going on in all of our complicated lives to find a space where we can blend those first person emerging accounts with third person so that's my two cents i think it's a, a it's a it's a very uh a challenging situation that we're in and we're using this media i think in a different way um i think marco has been a leader in breaking out of the the, the facebook kind of psychology and um he's encouraged me to get out of that world and i have um, so, you know, we're trying to do something different. And, um, I think we've, we've had some, some, um, some successes as well. I think we're doing some things really well. Mm. So. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I will jump on in now. Um, I'm, thank you, John, for what you said, and 
uh, I guess I'll give my personal background coming into this this Cosmos Cooperative, the, the online site, um, and participation in general. Uh, I come from a background of self-enclosing bubbles. Um, sorry, we've been reading Slaughter Dyke recently, so there's going to be a lot of, I, I noticed you, you had two, Terry. Um, but I, I came into this group uh, stating that I'm an undercover agent where I live. I, I literally, and besides my personal family and the, the friends that I have, um, I'm kind of exploring this wilderness here in Frankfort, Kentucky, where there's not many people I can find that have shared what we're sharing here or able to have this conversation. Um, but at, at the same time, I, I am a, discovering that everyone is involved in this process. Um, I came, I moved a couple of years ago. This, this is going to be an example that kind of leads into maybe how, how, how can we converse with those who on Facebook in, in the political scene, it's just going to be a constant brick wall. Um, how do we break into the, the fourth wall, I suppose. Uh, but my, my neighbor, I came into the neighborhood and his son is riding around on a power wheel with a Confederate flag. Um, has one posted in his yard. Uh, he holsters a gun. He's foul mouth, alcoholic, uh, whatever else you want to throw in there. He might be um, your typical stereotypical fella. But as I've gotten to know him, he's possibly one of the most caring guys in the world, that in my world. And the most recent example, which I don't think I've shared with anybody here, is a birthday party for his son, um, which I consider him to have race, racist tendencies, um, not not based on his outward appearance, but speaking with him as well, he he's come across as not fully agreeing with fully agreeing with. Um, there's a black college here in Kentucky uh, and Frankfurt. Um, He's told me stories, this and that, but he invited um, this family, his, they're Indian from India, and I, we, we were there, I was there, I have a, couple, a, a son, two sons now, but at that time I had one son, and they're all playing in the backyard, and we're sitting there having some sort of conversation, but the, the parents came back after they had dropped their, their son off, and we had an, an hour long conversation and this, this Confederate fella, this neighbor of mine, he welcomed them into the country, welcomed them into his home. He basically said, you can come here anytime. Um, I'm glad you and my, uh, our sons are becoming friends. And they, they just felt wonderful. And that, that type of, I, I felt guilty at that time for having any, even myself, who I don't, I'm not one to be stereotypical. I'm not one to um, judge as much as my initial thought might might do. I'll, I'll tamp that down as much as I can. But to, I, I was wondering, what, what have I done to actually welcome individuals? I might have certain political views that are more welcoming to uh, refugees or more welcoming to just world, the, the, basically the message you're sending through in your book. And, but I, I realized what have I, I literally have done nothing other than I'm, I'm a good reader and I can share conversations with people around me. So I'm, I'm stepping into that, that role um, that you're getting at in your book of what, how can I be the change? How can I, how can I find that passion of what I, I see as the, the heartbreak? Um, how can I participate and, and share my love, which is it's hard enough to do even with the ones I love <laughs> at times. But um, I, I came across the Quaker group last year and came across this site and I'm, I'm literally, my life is changing. Um, 
in the most amazing ways I've never imagined before. Uh, and I, I don't have any questions like how how can I best do this as a, a quiet, mild mannered fella, reach out, be more political. I, I don't know if that's for me, but um, it, it's. I guess my my heartbreak. I I, I, I like uh, I don't know the fella who did the introduction. I can't think of his name right now, but I, I like Andrew Harvey. I like his words. I like his the way he is saying things. And I, I guess for me, my my heartbreak is whatever I'm involved with at that moment, whoever is in front of me. Um, so I I think I'll stop there. But I really appreciate kind of some words. You've, you've had in the book are going to stick with me for quite a while, and I'll carry that with me wherever I, I go as an undercover agent here, here in Kentucky. Thanks, there. Um, if, if nobody else has something to respond to that, I'd like to say a, a word or two. Um, so Consider that who you're being in the field that you are emanating in that neighborhood next to your neighbor might have um, helped to facilitate that kind of interaction to happen. So in other words, don't beat yourself up for not doing anything. I mean, who you're being um, creates a field. And if, if you um, are, you know, emanating that field, whether unconsciously or consciously, like if you take it conscious and emanate it out to your whole neighborhood, you can be doing profound things to be um, uh, I don't know quite what the right word is, um, uh, but I'll just stick with the creating the, the field metaphor of, of inclusion in your neighborhood just by who you're being consciously. Um, and thank you for that. Thank you. You know, we need undercover agents like you doing and being in an integral way to create um, a, a more pervasive Field, you know, the hundredth monkey effect. That's it. A brief comment on that. I, uh, we, we, we're doing another reading group on The Minor Gesture by Aaron Manning. And I made the comment that I'm an undercover agent uncovering a jumpsman, which is kind of, I, I don't know exactly how to define that term, but uncovering kind of the potential within each given situation, maybe, or the, not necessarily environment, but uh, the, the space, but yeah, what you just said, so that was fun. I'm waiting for you, Ed. <laughs> But, but Why? You, okay, well, just in case, just in case. But, uh, if I if I if I have something I need to say, believe me, I'll just I'll 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 get in. I'm, okay. I'm good. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say. I mean, I think we can move beyond the integral conversation. Um, to me, um, we've had it uh, as far as re, you know, litigating the, the past or the genealogies. Um, I've written a piece on it. I've said my piece. Uh, that's on the Metapsychosis website, Integral in Me. You could read about my whole history with that. And, you know, you don't need Integral to resonate with people. Everybody is born, everybody dies, everybody suffers, everybody gets sick, right? That's all you need, I think, to resonate with people. Uh, and <clears throat> so to the extent that you do that, Doug, then you are creating a field, whether you know, and to the extent that you read, then you make that field a lot more interesting, I think, uh, because it gives you a much richer array of metaphorical possibilities, expressive possibilities. And, and so that's what, where I really think the value of conversation is, is that we are, are, we get stuck in reifications, in concepts that are, you know, 
um, that hold certain kinds of relationships in, in play or that serve certain purposes in our psychology. But the purpose of conversation is to break that up and to regenerate the field so that we have new ways of speaking about because reality is always renewing itself. This is, I think, what you write about, Terry. You, you speak about the skipping to chapter three on wholeness and frag fragmentation, the resurgence of wholeness and the ways in which the fragmentation um, triggers a response uh, of what, what you write about as wholeness, what we might call integral, what could be called any number of different things, but we're kind of, we're talking about the same thing. Uh, and so, you know, in times when there is such rampant fragmentation, such strife and so forth, it really calls on us to, you know, let wholeness come through us and let wholeness begin to manifest its kind of healing effects, uh, which are nonlinear. They're, 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 um, um, you know, non -predict they're not predictable. They're incalculable. Right. Uh, but we know it. We know it when we are participating in it. There's a there's an aesthetic knowing, I believe, and an ethical knowing. And as we share our first person accounts, uh, we can begin to parse like what we really mean by our ideas and what we really have experienced. Uh, because it, given the limitations of our language, of our culture, we may not even have the language for it yet. This is something that Lisa has really brought to our conversation. She wrote a piece called Transforming Language to Transform the World. And uh, I'll you know, let you speak to that. But the, the idea is really how do we find ways that are adequate um, so that we can coordinate more effectively and you know, be more whole amongst ourselves, not just within ourselves. Can I, before you speak, Lisa, could I just do a little genealogy? Yeah. I met Lisa at the Getzer Society um, back in October, I believe it was. Yes. And um, she gave a, a, a great talk uh, drawing on, on the Gnostics and on uh, language and non-ordinary states of consciousness. And she asked a question when, because we were all, uh, we were all students of Gebser and uh, his version of integral, um, which has differences with Wilbur's version of integral, or Steiner's version of integral, or Aurobindo's version. There are many integralisms, many different streams, I think, as you mentioned, Marco, that are making up this, um, this, this new possibility that many of us are, are very encouraged by. Anyway, you, you, you said, you asked us um, when you were, you, you talked about the difference between speaking about integral and speaking from integral. Yeah. And you, you ask when you're when you're speaking from integral, that's like what? And I just blurted out. Well, for me, that's like a like a Klein bottle. Um, and you look very surprised. And then later on, we had a conversation all about Klein bottles and topology and Stephen Rosen, who's a friend of yours, who my who who I was reading. And I had a lot of authors I was excited about that you knew. So I thought that these are great connections. And then uh, when you came on here and uh, presented uh, that paper and ha we've had more conversations since, I've been very um, inspired because I think that that question is a very suggestive one. Uh, when we're speaking about integral, we're necessarily going into a meta space. But I think when you're speaking from integral, it would seem to me that's a different kind of, I believe that that requires a, a, a very robust first person. And the capacity for metaphor, I believe, would be a sign that, uh, that if you can self-generate metaphors, you're going to be probably um, working with more than if you're just talking about something in a detached, and I think you would say, Terry, maybe a, a, a pseudo kind of immunity that third person can um, produce. So I'm hoping we can create a new kind of immunity that isn't based in military metaphors that come out of, um, you know, let's, let's nuke it or bomb it or, or cut it out. Um, those medical metaphors of in, in immune, immunology are just rampant. But I would like the idea that maybe 
our immunity could be much more about making meaning rather than defining an identity at a biological level. Let's make meaning and so that we don't have to fight the microbial world because if we try, we will, we will probably lose. And I think that those kind of biological metaphors can transfer into, into our sociology as well. So I, I, that's where I think uh, there's a lot of us who have been playing around with these metaphorical constructs and trying to look at other ways of operating rather than with that, that war metaphor, which seems so pervasive in our culture. So th thank you, Lisa, and thank you all for uh, sponsoring this conversation today. So if you if something comes up for you, Lisa, you want to share, I'd, I'd really be appreciative. Um, Terry, do you want to respond to him at all? Or, or? Yeah, actually, I, I, I have something that's coming up for me. It, it feels to me um, like there's... Uh, You know, the, it, it, we've all read chapter one of that of that book and the introduction, and that's a you know that, that's intense. <laughs> Those realities are intense, and uh, there's a um, I want to I want to be together in a way that is more being with. You know, uh, Douglas, you have young kids, you know, all of us care about the world that our great grandchildren or their contemporary, you know, the, or if we don't have kids, you know, the, the generations to come are going to inherit the future of biodiversity and even potentials for, you know, what, what kind of world will our own well, this conversation or any of our, cre you know, anybody's books, anybody's writings, anybody's creative output, you know, resonate into. And how can we somehow be that resurgence of wholeness and resurgence of life? Life wants to live. Evolution wants to keep evolving something in, a, you know, somehow it's expressing itself through us. And I want to, let's feel each other. Let's express, you know, like somehow there's an a, a expression of, vulnerability of feeling of care and of uh you know we're dealing with impossible questions we don't have adequate answers so rehearsing what we do know isn't the point but being with each other in a way that's opening up to what we don't know feels important so those are the things that i want to draw us toward Uh, you know, that's interesting because um, as John was talking, I was, you know, like rehearsing in my head, okay, talk about this and talk about that and mention this. And, and, and then something interrupted me and said, no, let Terry talk first. And I, I think it's that kind of of you know like just being in the moment and with a group and and present to like uh get out of my own space and and into the group space that um is very valuable because now now uh what you've said has has moved me in an entirely different direction away from you know my own agenda um, and I'd, I'd like to, oh, it's not here. Um, I'd like to just share something that I was reading recently. Lynn Clare um, told me about this book called Stealing Fire. And uh, you know it. Yeah. So um, it's about an interesting phenomenon of, of people wanting to get into this space of ecstasis, um, you know, which John, you call a non-ordinary state. Um, and in uh, SEAL teams and in creative, you know, working groups, it's like, how do we, how do we merge 
into um, a, a, lar- a larger being, the group being, where there isn't, and we do this here, you know, there, there's kind of a, a leader who, you know, somebody else then takes the lead, and we kind of each hand off the lead at, at different points and feel into, you know, what the group's doing and where it's going and where to go next. And um, I think that's a, an important um, skill to to develop for this ongoing evolution that, that we're part of in becoming um, not just, you know, whole beings in and of ourselves, but uh, a whole being in terms of, you know, Gaia and the universe. You know, we're, we're, I think we're on a huge evolutionary journey to, to emerge an entirely new level of connectedness. Um, Um, and, and, well, I, I guess that's all I have to say about that. That's a lot though. (laughs) (laughs) And I mean, what comes to mind for me is that, you know, there's always this dialectic between individual and the social and you don't want to lose the individual sensibility, the individual perspective, right? I mean, we like the, like the attention that you particularly feel, the voice that you particularly hear is not going to come through somebody else. So to merge into a group kind of self or a group identity loses the value of your particularity. Uh, And at the same time, if the particularity is atomistic in the sense of separate and not attuned to the kind of other entities in the field, then you lose that that connectivity. But I think that like part of that, like dialogue, like part of the idea of a climb bottle, right. Is that it's inherently non-dualistic. Yeah. It, it doesn't presume that that category, that categorical, that categoricalization. Right. So the starting point in a climb bottle is wherever, like it, it, it may be individual, it may be collective, it may be some hybrid. It's always in motion. And I think, you know, the, what get, what's interesting is when we have like, um, new spaces to move into. Right. And so like Terry's book, I want to bring it back to that sensibly about, about the book is a uh, new Republic of the heart. That's a metaphor. Uh, and part of the creative um, genius of this book is that it is um, evoking an ancient metaphor and a kind of new metaphor at the same time. It's combining, I think, different um, dimensions or aspects of reality. We have a political component in the Republic, this you know, the idea of a body politic. But we also have the somatic intelligence, the heart intelligence that comes through the, the rest of that title. So it's not pointing to exactly a, um, a, a, an exclusively exterior orientation around ordering a perfect society. It's, it's bringing attention back into the, um, the heart dimension, the effective uh, dimension of, of our shared reality. And I think saying that whatever political actions, activism, solutions, programs, prescriptions, etc. we might, we might, um, you know, want to advocate on behalf of, uh, there, there's a, there's a space that that can be held within, which is a lot more intimate and a lot more closely, um, uh, entwined with our emotional being and our social being. And so, I mean, that's, what, that's one of the challenges of this kind of conversation is that we're trying to think big. We're trying to think about complex challenges like an ecological crisis or like political you know, crisis, transnational globalization and the, you know, all the ramifications of the moment, 
historically that we're in, but we're trying to do that in a way that doesn't lapse into the kind of talking head uh, mentality that divides everything up, fragments everything, and kind of um, binds us like in a limited sphere of action. Like what are the what actions would even be called for if we were working on emerging into a kind of Gaia mind? Like what would what would that political program even look like? This is what I feel Terry's trying to channel or transmit is a really futuristic. It's not futuristic in the mental kind of transhumanist future. It's futuristic in that it just doesn't exist yet. Like we don't exactly know what that um, world would look like. What would a new republic of the heart? even look like beyond the poetry of it? What would that mean in actuality? Um, and then what kinds of actions does that do the, what d- does that call forth in our, the imminence of our being together, being with? Uh, I, I don't know that we've really focused in on that quite yet in, in the conversation. I'm not, I'm not sure how to, how to, um, fine tune the, the, uh, you know, the, the radio dial here. <clears throat> I have something. But Ed, did, Ed, Doug, does someone want to? I was. Th- I thought maybe Terry would say something because that was exactly oh. the point. I, I also, I will speak. I'll interrupt. Sorry, John. But no, 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 please. I'm just inviting um, someone. I, I was. I was also very taken by the metaphor of the title of your book. And I live in a place that's much more like where Doug is than where John is. Everybody around me are craftsmen and farmers. And they don't, they don't think in any terms like we've been discussing here. They, don't, they all care about the environment. Obviously, they're farmers. Their livelihoods depend on it. They notice things are changing. And, and I understand for, for you, Terry, that, that you recognize the magnitude of what this looks like globally. But I, I would argue that, that the vast majority of human beings don't because they have more on their plate with themselves than they have with everything that's around them. And, if you're, and, and so to me, it's, it's important also to, to understand you know, where, where, you were, where you're going with this metaphor because I think we have to take everyone that we encounter seriously. And I think we have to deal with them on every level of their being, however they are. So, so what, what's, I have two questions. What's the Republic part of it? That, that is one. And the second one is what's radical about all of this? I don't under, I, I've gone through more than just the first three chapters and I, I'm not still not quite clear on what, the radicality of it is. So that, that's, those are a couple of things I'd like to have a little more flesh put on the bones at this point. Well, the, uh, the Republic metaphor is, uh, it comes out of a couple of things. One of them is the later chapters of the book talk about how in a way we've been given by our circumstance, you know, somehow our souls consented to be here. Now we are all people of this time. This is where our opportunity to, you know, our, if we have a purpose in life, it's a purpose relevant to this situation. And that uh, has called us. So somehow we are equal to this task. There is something about this that's for us. And, uh, and yet we can't respond to it alone. We like the, the challenges are collective challenges. And yet w- we are in a time when our existing governmental and even our media and uh, you know, like the reason we are having this conversation in a different way is because almost all the formats for human interaction that are public have become useless. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't have a way to talk about what really matters that is, is in anywhere close to adequate to our, our situation. Our collective decision-making is not, not even vaguely governed by our best intelligence or wisdom. 
And, and yet we have, to the degree that we have this awareness, we have a responsibility to try to embody a, a force that would change that. So that means we have to turn to others. And how do you do that? Well, the only way you can do that is to begin to share some values. And those values have to affect the way that you show up. So that's practice. Recognizing that I want to consciously be the best version of myself in each moment. And that I need to do that with you. And, that we, and if we can agree about how we do that together, we become a community of practice. And then our discourse is not just each of us immune in, you know, like I just accept you exactly or no matter what, and you have your contribution. No, it, it begins to become a situation where I can call you to do the practice that we have agreed is real. Like if there's a, if you're just being self-referential and abstract and there's a way of being more immediate and more vulnerable, I can ask you to do that. And we no longer are out of reach of one another. And if we engage that kind of dialogue over time, we become a community of practice that can begin to engage a shared inquiry. And a shared inquiry is the circumstance in which new understanding that's more adequate to our problems could arise. This is why David Bohm, so many years ago, observing that the world was heading to a crisis, pointed to dialogue as the way forward. So if we become communities of practice, I call those tribes in some places, but the interactions and, and, and conversations among communities of practice and tribes become important. And as soon as we begin to have a community of practice that's having a real conversation, we need to be in dialogue with other communities of practice that have real conversations. And then pretty soon you're dealing with something like a representative form of dialogue. And ultimately, if it were to fulfill its potentials, governance. And that would be a republic. A republic is a representative form of collective decision-making and governance. So that's where the word republic comes from in the title. And as far as radicality, um, you know, radical means going to the root. With the word radish, same root as radical. So what's the root? Well, in, in a way, uh, there's two ways of talking about radical that I have been very influenced by. One of them is radical politics, where people say what, what's really going on and what's radical is to go to the root of things and not just be so influenced by the current political conversation and being willing to think outside the box and go to the root of things. And then there's radical consciousness, radical spirituality, which has to do with awakening to what's at the root of reality. One of those leads, in a way, to what you're actually doing and behaviors and the physicality, that's the political one. And the other leads to pure consciousness, you might say the most profound but abstract level of reality. So it, the radical is the, the two ends of things, the, the most concrete and the most diffuse and abstract. And yet both are present in this moment. It is only with the freedom of recognizing ourselves as awareness itself, unbounded, unreasonable happiness, that we have a well-being in which we can be okay, even in the midst of being interwoven with a world civilizational system that is totally wacko off the rails and seemingly bent on a destruction that would affect us and everyone we love. How do we be happy? How do we be okay in the midst of that without knowing how to turn it around? Well, we just... It's an unreasonable happiness, and it's founded really in being itself or consciousness. And yet, if it's really radical, it's going to have to find its way into actual shit happening in, in the real world, in, 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 in material terms, in a politically radical sense, too. So that's how I understand those two things. Very helpful. Thank you.
John, did you want to say something? <clears throat> yeah, I'm just trying to take all of this in because there's so much going on in this conversation. Um, Lisa, you mentioned skill. And that triggered a response because to me, I'm very attracted to skills, skill building. And a lot of the initiatives that I've been developing here have been about skill building. Um, uh, learning at your best, reading at your best, writing at your best. We've had these little workshops, small, not every member here, but some of us have gotten together. Um, I think we did in intuiting at our best at one time. Um, but my intention here is if we get each person's version of these skills performed at their best, I believe that we can start moving towards um, something that Marco repeats over and over again about cosmoethics. Um, because I believe being ethical at my best will emerge more often when I'm uh, in a community of competence is emerging where we're, we all are aware, oh, this is how she learns at her best. This is how he intuits at his best. These are different metaphors they may use, but there's something uh, underneath the metaphors and between those metaphors that I believe uh, adds a richness to the intersubjective field. And so when we, when we, this metaphor of a new republic of the heart um, a very beautiful one that I could certainly enjoy. Um, I'm also, uh, others have different metaphors for uh, uh, the possible futures that we could start to uh, work with. Um, and Gidley, who's a researcher that we've all studied here, she talks about post-formal reasoning, planetarization, multiple futures. Um, but we're moving, as she mentions, towards something like what I think, I think you and Gidley would share quite a bit about uh, futures that you would both enjoy developing. But I think she, she refers to uh, a factory model of education that we've all been raised in, which basically inhibits or constrains our imaginations to function in very, you know, predetermined ways. And I think when we talk about different levels, uh, and we diff talk about different capacities. We also have to talk about this isn't an even playing field uh, that we're in. There are some people who are very poor, who are living off of a couple of dollars a day if they're lucky. And there are some people who have plenty of leisure. You know, they may use it in very creative ways and they may be just gazing at their navels. Um, I think in some of us are in between and this crazy uh, capitalist society where we're they're boom and bust cycles so we can be you know poor one day and rich the next and then poor again so as we're looking at this factory model how are we going to get to like this this grid where we have 20 years of childhood and education 45 years maybe 50 years of work where we pay back to the society and about 15 years of retirement where we basically um get ready for biological death. That's basically what the factory model is about. And um, I've resisted all of that. Um, and I've sort of done the best that I could under very uh, uneven circumstances and with my very uneven development. And I, I, I assume that others have dealt with this as best as they could as well. So I'm just wondering how can we transition from this factory model that I think we're all pretty familiar with to the various uh, visionary futures that I think we want to open up to those possibilities, cognitively, more maps, and also somatically, engaging the somatic intelligence. So that's what I'm learning for this conversation. How can we create uh, those ecology of practices that are going to give us the skills that I think we're going to, to need, enhancing the ones that we already have, because I think everyone here is a very, a very accomplished person. So anyway, those are my um, big question marks about how do we make that transition? How do we know if we're tran making the transition? How do we know if we're not getting anywhere close to a transition? 
I mean, I'd like to just my, I don't want to talk at length, but just very briefly, you know, my chapters six and seven in the book are all about practice, life as practice and the new stories of our souls. And they, they are my response to that question. I think the way that we, that there's a lot that we can do right now. And that has to do with recognizing that every one of us we're, we're, we're in an age of complexity in which the kind of human who's adequate to really meet it is beyond us. I'm not, I'm not developed enough. I'm not awake enough. I'm not wise enough. I'm not a lot, you know, I'm not a mil, you know, there's so many different virtues that I could fruitfully grow in, in order to be adequately show up for this crazy, uh, you know, this, this moment seems on one level like a, a, a terrific crisis of fragmentation, a kind of mindfuck, clusterfuck, you know, ah. And on another level, it's an opportunity for growth. A new level of human maturity is required. And every one of us would have to go beyond our current way of being in order to meet that. And there are all kinds of ways to cultivate that transformation. And it isn't something we have to know how to do. It's like, like improv, you show up for each moment with a kind of positive expectancy and willingness and generosity and creativity and who knows what's next. And that's, and, and that's how we neurons that fire together, wire together by being in that kind of pregnant, open kind of way of being, we gradually become more adequate, less inadequate to the, ridiculous challenges that are before us and uh and that then translates also into each other help not just developing oneself but develop it with self-help that is help of one another previous metaphor we use at one point um Things were getting a little heated when we had a discussion about Sam Harris. Um, I'm one to kind of give him a chance. Um, John and Ed here are saying that this guy is wacko. He's an idiot. He doesn't get the full picture. Uh, so I, I don't know if you said it first, Ed, or if I did, but I'm one to want everybody to come into my sandbox. And I realize and I, I love Ed's metaphor that maybe it was his metaphor, but we do have sandboxes all over the place and we invite each other to play every now and then. Um, but some, if, if, if we invite Sam Harris, he's going to knock over the, the church structure I just built. He's going to um, kind of disrupt the, the structures we're building here. And John, you're kind of getting at how, how do we, branch out to all these people even even at the same time like even integral the word in, like we're saying no let's let's uh scoot our sand pile over here and kind of separate that little path the, the little tracks we make that lead to their their sandbox and say, no um, so it's going to and there's constant rain coming down to destroy our structures there's constant sand is immutable and creations there's sand castles always destructing being disrupted everywhere um but maybe we can learn that if we combine sand with water and uh, certain other materials that it will stay uh, it can't be destroyed and what you're getting at terry is um the love aspect and i i made a comment to ed and he said well go for it <laughs> in my my lifetime of practice i i couldn't get there but um I tend to love everyone in a certain aspect. I, I'm willing to hear them out. I'm willing. I haven't had the negative experience of the, the Harris materialist thing. Well, um, that, that's only going to lead you down a road of like your, your sandcastles will be destroyed once you realize he's, he's very, that materialist aspect is very limited. Um, but I'm still trying to make those connections and, um, we, we all are and that's what I see is what you're talking about Terry and 
we're all working on how can we invite each other to each other's sandboxes. Um, one universal sandbox is not going to happen anytime soon. Um, so where do we go? <laughs> how do we do it? So I, I've been, I, I have a metaphor that I'd like to put out there that um, uh, I think pulls a lot of these threads together. Um, I, I work in the field of medicine and, and biology, so it's a, it's a biological metaphor. And uh, what I see happening, like, in, in the big picture um, is that we're, we're coming to a, a stage in our development um, that we could liken to when um, a bunch of cells originally came together and specialized and became a different kind of organism. Um, and so right now we're, we're in the middle, if, if each one of us is like a cell, we're in the middle of finding out whether, you know, I'm a, a heart cell or a neuron or a kidney cell or, you know, what is it that I do best? Who do I, who do I you know, function um, well with, you know? And, and how does my functioning say as, as um, you know, a, a, a nerve cell, you know, a, a connector, something that connects a signal from one part of the body to another part of the body, you know, how, how must I interact with, you know, heart cells and muscle cells, etc. cetera. Um, okay. So, so the level of complexity, you know, like, like, fractals bigger because it's not just humans it's not just us that is coming together into this this um meta being for lack of a better word um we are all part of gaia we are all uh part of the universe and so um, it's not just humans. We need to, you know, communicate with the birds and the trees and learn from them. They have a different kind of intelligence. And Steve Rosen goes into, you know, the, these other levels of intelligence, the, the mineral, the animal, the vegetable. Um, and there are people out there who are non-human um, life forms. And I, I think in terms of, uh, you know, how, how we're going to um, get through this, this kind of crisis situation of fragmentation that we're in um, will depend on, on how well we can um, negotiate this reorganization um, of humans to, uh, to being, um, parts of, but very important parts of a, a larger being such that we can be both unique or unique. We each have a unique contribution to make to this larger being and part of the whole and, um, you know, understanding that there, there is no separation there. Um, uh, and that there's a new type of consciousness that's going to need to arise in order for that to happen. Um, a consciousness that will be able to handle the, the kind of, of both andness of being unique and being part of a greater whole in which I have a part to play, but my part isn't, you know, like the star of the show. Um, uh, so, so that's, that's the metaphor that, that I've been carrying around in, in my mind um, and trying to uh, find a, uh, 
languaging to help us get there. Um, because the either or language, you know, the kind of logic, the kind of nominalization of separation of, you know, um, uh, birds from bees, from humans, from, you know, whatever, uh, is, it is limited. And, and in order to, to get to this more, um, integrated type of, of being, um, I think we need to develop new types of language, but also get beyond language. The, the, the developing new parts of language or new types of language that are more both and is kind of only a first step to, you know, like getting beyond language. Okay. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Can, can I ask you a question, Lisa? Yeah. Go ahead. New types of language and beyond language. And handle both and, and, and you talked about parts and holes, and the star of the show. Is there anything else about star of the show? Um, yeah, let me go get, let me go get something that uh, is, I want to show you guys. Okay. Okay. Um, this is, this is a little crystal cube that um, a, a sculptor by the name of John Kuhn made. And I, I love to share this as um, a simple model of, of how each one of us is important to the whole. Um, and uh, in the sense that, okay, you know, light comes in, okay, let's, let's use light as a metaphor for divinity, okay, so light comes in, and this is made up of a bunch of, it hits each piece of crystal differently, so the light refracts as a, a different color depending on how it's coming in and, and how it's hitting, so, so each one of us has a, um, our way of refracting the light and you know it can change it's not you know none of this is static um but if one of these pieces was missing the whole the integral would would be compromised um and so but but there isn't one piece that you know is like bigger or more prominent than, than the other. So, um, but at, at any given time, you know, the, uh, the light from one might, you might, you know, see that more prominently than the light from another. So there's always a, a shifting, um, of whose light is shining at it at any given time. Does that speak to what you were saying? Th thank you. That was great. So, um, let's see if we can connect a couple of things. John, you were talking about skill building capacities. Um, the light that reflects through each of us differently, different colors. Maybe these are can correlate to different kinds of skills or capacities or their unique ways we may constellate uh, these um, abilities. We have the metaphor of a new republic of the heart, and that implies a certain whole kind of series of metaphors <clears throat> like citizenship. Like there's a sense that we need to be citizens uh, of this republic of the heart. Not that we need to be, but that really what would enable us to be at, um, adequate, competent, uh, citizens who could self-govern in the way that uh, you know the founding fathers of the of Western democracies imagined, uh, and you know Terry, you have been now launching a book. You've been doing these talks with a variety of people in a variety of contexts, podcasts, and 
um, different kinds of interview formats. So you've been engaging in this kind of cross-contextual, trans-contextual kind of conversation. Um, <clears throat> and so you have kind of have a unique perspective as well on how this light is refracting amongst these you know, different actors. What are you seeing in the course of these conversations? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, there's the, the biggest thing that, that I see happening that I feel good about is that I think some of my readers and some of the people who I've been in dialogue with in some of these media outlets have let in the two bar across the first chapter represents. And they've, um, I mean, it is so hard. Like it, in a way, if you realize that there was, a, there was an interesting, uh, piece that Bill McKibben wrote for the New Yorker last week, where he visited uh, Hiroshima, the, the, the museum and memorial, and he talked about how we can get our heads around that horror and decide we need to make that stop. But right now, all the little tiny explosions in pistons and turbines and everywhere else of, of, of fossil fuels that are... Uh, pouring all this carbon into the atmosphere is in his view, by far the most important thing that's happening in the world every day, but our attention doesn't go to it because it's the same every day. It doesn't draw itself out to our attention. We can't see it like a nuclear explosion. And you know, I posted something about that on Facebook because uh, I thought other people would see it there. And uh and what I'm seeing is that when people look at the incredible tangle of causes and conditions that have us so karmically unable even to cognize and feel and allow ourselves to be present to our larger context and, and, and to integrate that with our feeling, you know, we, we end up behaving as though uh, none of that is happening. And, and if we did behave like it was all happening, what would we do? Would we panic? Would we start screaming and yelling and, oh, my God, we've got to do something about this right away? That wouldn't be very productive. And so the oddity of the sanity that is appropriate and, and the kind of, you know, not hyped up and overexcited, you know, freaked out, the end of the world is nigh kind of orientation. And yet we're in a tipping point in which something that seems like it threatens to bring something like the end of our world is nigh. And yet we find our way into conversations that are always more abstract and indirect. And we don't show up emotionally and feelingly as if all of this is real and it's so hard to do it. So I've had conversations with people where through their engagement with the book, you know, some of the interviewers, God bless them, you know, actually read the whole book and the constellation of insights that finally accrete as you go through the different chapters, take them to a different place. And I, and I be, sometimes will have a, uh, a conversation where that sense of beginner's mind of, oh my God, I'm seeing this. You know, they, they let the book shock them into a new vulnerable relationship and then there's more of a human meeting. What I, what I mostly see going on are people who are in denial. I mean, our whole culture is in denial. I think, I think you guys are really endeavoring to engage with this, but you reflect this too. I do too, but you know, one of the things I say very often when I give a public talk is we're all social creatures. We partake of our social surround. Therefore, we're all in denial. I'm in denial. I can't help but be in denial because I'm attuning to a cultural environment in which everybody has ag agreed. You know, you turn on the TV, browse the internet, look at what's happening in the world and the way we're telling the story of what is real to one another. And we're 
all in denial. And, and being able to be present to it in a deeper way is hard. And to me, I mean, the biggest sign of it is a, an emotional shift, a kind of uh, vulnerability, a being in a tender question that matters and a feeling vulnerability. That's what comes forward for me that makes me feel like we're beginning to have the real conversation. Can I respond to that? Um, unless someone else wants to respond. I have a, um, I know you're a fan of, of Michael Murphy, Terry. He wrote a wonderful book, Future of the Body. And he was inspired by Sri Aurobindo. And I recently picked up a book in a used bookstore by Aurobindo called The Future Poetry. Sounds to me like you're, interested in the future politics just by the title of your book. And um, Lisa, when you said um, the star of the show and you sort of developed that metaphor and used the, 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 that, uh, that crystal, was that a crystal? Yeah. And you described the light. I realized, oh, well, well each of us is in a sense, a star of the show. So, I think that um, when we say things like be spontaneous, that's a double bind. That's a paradoxical demand because if I'm spontaneous, then I've obeyed the demand, which means I'm not spontaneous at all. So when I'm in a, when I'm being told be ecological in where exactly am I to be ecological? When I go to Whole Foods and they ask me, do you want plastic or do you want paper? Um, these are the kind of questions. That's a fairly simple one to answer. You can just bring your tote bag with you. But there are uh, other kinds of situations where it's far from unclear or clear. It's far from clear about uh, what an appropriate ecological response could possibly be, especially when there's an uneven playing field that's so dramatic and you're asking people who are, who are at the edge to uh, give up something that makes their livelihood possible so that, that, so that other people can um, use their air conditioning all summer long. So I think these are the kind of, I think we have to be fine, let's say be ecological, but also let's be very sensitive to the, the binding pattern that we in some ways are promoting We're putting people, I think, in, um, I think just being able to sit in that paradox for as long as you can may create opportunities, may create conditions for something else to happen. So I agree with you. It's easy to go into denial and just kick back and have another beer and watch TV and go into that TV low-level trance state that many of us or go shopping or whatever we do to distract ourselves. But I'm all for creating, um, I would say, high quality trance states, like asking questions that invite the imagination to get engaged so that we can blend cognitive and somatic intelligences. And I believe that using metaphor is a, is a royal way of entering into highly creative trance states that then can translate between these very different, these very complex dimensions that uh, we tend to favor only a few of. We just look at the, a very few, uh, a very narrow bandwidth. And we, we, so we have a very monophasic culture, basically, basically produced by our factory model education. So that's why I, where I'm um, putting my attention is on language and the future of language. And I believe Lisa is a, it has been a real catalyst for me. She's inspired me a great deal. And I know Mark is a poet and um, many of us enjoy writing. And uh, Ed certainly is a, a scholar, our curmudgeon over there. And, you know, Terry, I think you have an activist background as do I. So I think we're all doing probably the best we can. Um, I know I am. I'm doing the well, very uh, like, best. Except, except that the best, the best we can has always is under is is under a profound pressure to get better. And Absolutely, being together, 
being together, not in a way that demeans what we've been able to do up until now or, 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 or loses sympathy for our, us as, as humans, but which is, 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 is brought forward, awakened, pulled, pulled by the necessity of more and better of, in, in some way and really doesn't, doesn't try to answer. One of the problems is, you know, I, I, I use this metaphor of the koan because the, the koan is really useful, you know, especially taken in uh, together with Rilke's admonition to live the questions and love the questions, not to curtail, not to close the question with your imperfect answer so that you can move on and feel at peace, but let the pressure of the unresolved questions continue to move. If we could be in those questions together actively now, acting as if we need better answers to these questions now. How can we find our way into being differently and being differently with ourselves and each other in this crazy uh, moment in the human evolutionary journey? And, and, there, and, and the fact of the matter is, if there is to be change, there are ways that each of us can be that change. And if we inquire into that with a, a kind of willingness and, 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 and you know, like, get rid of our conditioned mind that only can imagine what we already know and let ourselves be present to a, to a living process in which something genuinely new is possible, genuinely interested in new possibility. That feels like the disposition that I'm asked to find my way into again and again. And you can't just do that. It's like, it's different to do it in this moment than it was Yesterday, you know, it's it's always a fresh uh, challenge and opportunity, and it, and if I really wake up to it somehow, it because it's, there's heartbreak and loss and grief and you know, in a sense of unaccountable disaster present to this, it's profoundly vulnerable and 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 it has gravitas. And then in another way, this unreasonable happiness, the finding my way into it with a willingness to embrace life. Okay, this moment, I'll be here. I'm willing. You know, there's a freshness and a lightness and a lightheartedness despite all that. And being together in that, that's an experiment. That's a, wow, that's intense. And we're in that question. And, 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 and even though I'm saying all these things, I'm not really as brokenhearted or as lighthearted as the moment calls for, you know, and I'm being pressed forward into more vulnerable authenticity, you know, and, 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 and if we can be transparent in that, perhaps we become friends in a different way and, 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 and our conversations can catalyze even something more profound. I agree that we can be better. And I also believe that we're good enough already. Um, Maybe we don't need more. We just need to pay attention to what we already have. And sometimes great abundance. So I'm just very aware of this, having been raised in this factory model with this uh, most of my life paying, uh, paying allegiance to this neoliberal vision and having uh, great disruptions. I've had to... Uh, replan a lot. Um, and so I'm looking at how do I, um, with my limitations that I have, and all, all of us do have enormous limits on what we can learn and what we can do. I'm not going to study quantum physics and I'm not going to study ballet. I'm going to do what I already do pretty well. And I want to do it a little bit better than I already do. So I believe that there's translation is just as necessary as transformation. Actually, transformation can't happen unless, unless there's been adequate translations. I'm borrowing from Wilbur here. So I think that um, we, we can do both, hopefully at the, even at the same time. Everybody is a star. I can feel it when you shine on me. 
I love you for who you are, not the one you feel you need to be. But I, I'm not a singer. That's I'll work on it later. But I think you are a singer. <laughs> I like it. Great, great. Yeah, you got a lot further than I would have. That was my my first attempt there. But um, recently, which we didn't get to do a Cosmos Cafe on Genius, um, but Marco. Yeah. You made the comment that everyone that you wanted you you're a genius you you know it and you recognize it i think everyone as long as they're not psychologically disturbed or willing to dig deep into their own selves they realize i'm a genius i just don't know how to say it and um what i appreciate with your your vision at least maybe this is something you're working on too terry um, is recognizing the underdogs, recognizing the kind of the undercurrents in in our society, and you're you're a great listener, and you're you're listening around the world right now, as we as you've noted, and I, I'm, I'd like to see where this this goes. Uh, I know you have just based on looking at your website, you're you're going on a long journey here. It looks like around the globe to speak with people to uh, have conversations similar to this. Um, I, don't, I don't have anywhere I'm taking this. I just wanted to note that we all are working on that, um, recognizing the potential in each person, in each situation. Um, but the, the last line of the sly and the family stone song uh, is one big circle going around and around. So. I'm sure they're on quite a few psychedelics at the time when they came up with this this song, but uh, I feel that that's a way to tap in that they tapped into this realm. We, we're all tapping into that realm when we don't need any drugs to do that. We we need some form of love, even and it, it is paradoxical. Even when I'm sitting here talking about, oh, all we need is love. It's like shut the fuck up, dude. No, no, we don't. <laughs> Um, so, I just wanted to add that comment there. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Well, John Lennon said, you know, we need his love. And he also said, uh, I am you and you are me and we are all together. Yeah. I think we need a little curmudgeon here to bring it in. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay, just a little. <laughs> I listened to all of this with two ears, two different ears. One of them is the part of this group that I'm with. And the other one is, how does any of this help me talk to my neighbors? How do I make clear to my neighbors that they're in an existential crisis, that they don't recognize that they're in to the extent that Terry does or that Marco does or that I might? How do I make it clear to them that their very existence is so threatened that they should be scared shitless because if they were, they wouldn't function every day. And then the world stops. And then we have a real problem before we even get to the crisis problem because it stops. This is where I've, I, I have my conflict. This is probably a source of my curmudgeonry because I don't really understand why love is all you need isn't enough. What, what else is there? All of this talk about it, it's nice. It can be helpful for us as we're sitting here in our cafe. But at the end of the day, if you don't love your neighbor as yourself, it doesn't matter. You're not going to get anywhere with anyone anyway. Because you either are going to be in a way or they're going to be in the way. And you're going to love your neighbor as yourself a whole hell of a lot longer 
then he or she's going to love you as themselves. But if they don't, we're not going to get together at in a whole other realm than the one that we're engaged in right now. So I'm always looking for, and that was a, this is part of the reason, where's the radicality? I, I enjoyed the answer. It, it really is at the root. It's right down to the very root of who we are as people. But what Terry is asking us to do is change. And I want all of you to look around in your own little groups of people and point the finger at the one that you think is willing to do that. And since all of our fingers are going to be like this for a while, <laughs> pointing at ourselves, what are we going to do about it? Because this, as far as I'm concerned, is where it has to start. This, this is what I hear Terry saying again and again. Well, you got to get yourself sorted or you'll never get the world sorted. You, you can hope that the world gets sorted. I'm really appreciative that we have these opportunities to talk about these kinds of things. But I don't really, but I think the problem is, and this is the part I appreciate about is Republic of the Heart, that's, that's where it all lies. It really is in the heart. That's what we have to get, not our heads. Our heads have gotten us into nothing but trouble. That's what they're good at doing. That's, that's why we have little explosions and nuclear explosions, and we can't tell the difference. But our hearts know what the difference is. So we got to get our hearts activated. But we have to be able to do it. I have to be able to do it with the guy next door. Right, right Doug? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 this is the question I refrained from saying at the beginning because I, I didn't want to prod any yeah. false answer. But... Here's another example of my, my friendly Confederate family, but their mm -hmm. three-year-old has an enamel issue, and he's, the child is literally drinking Diet Coke each day, three-year-old. Maybe two or three, I don't know, I don't pay attention all day, but they'll be having Diet Cokes in hand, and that's the exact, I mean, it's not, they're doing it to themselves, but at the same time, they're supporting the sugar industry, they're supporting you are supporting medical issues here in the, the States and I, not that I'm afraid, but I don't have that relationship with them, even though we've become a version of fringe friends between us. Um, I don't know how to say to him, well, you idiot, you're feeding your, your kid Diet Coke all day long. And how do I talk about that in a respectful manner? How do I have a dialogue with this person? Um, I've come to the conclusion, a lot of it's my own personal either shyness, personal fear in social situations. And also, he's not going to listen to it. He's not ready for it. I'm not ready for it. So how do we reach that level? And it's already, I've lived there for two years now, and I, I can't have that conversation. I can't simply say, well, I mean, I've mentioned it a few times, the, the medical facts of, Yes, this will ruin your teeth, and can't you see that? You, you, you watch quite a bit of TV. You should be able to realize um, the disclaimers that are come along with sugar and this and that. But, um, but I'm respectful, and I, I, yeah, that's my question too. And how do I have that conversation with my neighbor that there's impending doom with the, the lifestyle, um, with the world around, and and we need to take that into account. But yeah, I'll stop there. I I, uh, I have to break in because I want to say goodbye and I have to go uh, soon. So uh, I really hope that uh, uh, you found something useful about engaging with uh, the first few chapters of my book. And uh, I really hope you'll read the whole thing. Uh, in a way, the what the what the book is about is what comes across through the totality of it. Although there are intuitions of all that it integrates it the, the, there's, it has so much sweep and specificity it doesn't really come fully into view until it's all there and uh i want to um also say that i think that 
right now, the idea of tipping point is an abstraction, but that we will find ourselves with, there'll be some future moment of catastrophic events taking place in which I think the book's message will seem relevant in a new way. And I, and I, in a sense, I, I, uh, I, I think grappling, you know, in a way that if, if I was to summarize the message of the book in one sentence, it would be now's the time. And uh, the meaning of that will come clearer to us when things bring that home in ways that are less abstract. And we'll, I hope that the, the heart message that you were pointing to, Ed, which is, is the essence of it. And, 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 and that, the, in, a, in a way, the whole book is a way of trying to operationalize the simplicity that love is all we need. But what it is to do that in this hyper complex time and fragment in this crisis of fragmentation uh, asks everything of, of me and I think all of us. And then mainly I want to thank you guys for engaging and for engaging with Marco, who I uh, love and uh, engaging with the experiment that is Cosmos uh, cafe, Cosmos uh, co-op rather. Because um, I think all of this is, uh, you know, I, I, there's a little section, you know, in chapter eight, I think it is, on cosmos. Uh, it's an expression of what the, the, this new republic of the heart is an idea, but it's also something that's already happening. And in some sense, you're already helping create it, even though it's always asking more. So I just kind of want to say a few, those few kind of summary sorts of things. Uh, just as a way of appreciating that you've been here and we've been able to engage for these couple of hours. I'm glad you were able to take the time. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. <clears throat> and uh, the conversation continues. Um, it's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful book, New Republic of the Heart. I'm holding it up for the video. Look at all the colors. Teal, pink, <laughs> cosmic, <laughs> eclipse. Oh, you can get you can get um, uh, like some stuff around it, and and I hope people will get on my mailing list. By the way, at newrepublicoftheheart dot com or terrypatton dot com. So yeah. thank you guys. Blessings. Thanks, Terry. Thank Thanks you, Terry. to all of you. Okay. Bye -bye. Uh, thank you, each and all. All right. Ciao. Well, till next time. Thank you. Enjoy. Bye bye.